Um, so if you would, uh, again, uh, turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, as you're getting there. Again, for those of you who are new to this study, uh, Ecclesiastes is one of those books where you might, it's, it's quite of, sort of small for the Old Testament. So to find it, kind of open your Bible halfway up, you'll probably hit uh, the Psalms, then go to Proverbs, and then right after Proverbs is Ecclesiastes. It's a part of the wisdom literature. So as you get there, um, and find your place, uh, and we will get started in just a moment. But let's open up in prayer. And again, if you have prayer requests, put those in the comments, and we will pray for those particular things at the end of our, our Bible study. So let's pray now. Father in heaven, we put this time into your hands and ask that for each person who is um, going to watch this or is watching this now, that you would speak to us in a very powerful way, that you'd give us the guidance and everything that we need, Lord, to follow you in, in spirit and in truth. So may your word come alive. May you draw us closer together and closer to you. Give us that wisdom, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yeah, um, I don't know about you, but I've been having a little bit of trouble keeping track of time uh, during this uh, stay-at-home order where... Uh, it's sometimes hard to know well, we, what time is it, uh, what, what day is it. Uh, and the reason is that we often measure time uh, by what goes on in those lengths of time. And so now uh, that the normal events of life are not happening, they're disrupted, it uh, disrupts our ability to track time uh, because our life, our perspective is bound by certain events and, 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 their, and their times. And we all have different perspectives on time. So maybe if you're a parent and you have your children at home and, you know, you say, all right, this is the time where you need to work on your schoolwork. And uh, it gets later in the day. You're like, oh, you don't know, like, how much time do we have left? And you're like, hey, it's only an hour more. And they're like, oh, an hour more, as if that's the longest time in the world. And you're thinking only an hour. And so if children and adults have different senses of time, we should not be surprised that the God, eternal God of the universe, has a different perspective on time than people as well. In fact, it reminds me of a scripture. Uh, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it from my notes. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 says this, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Uh, because when you're eternal, even millennia seem like a moment. Uh, one reason is that on earth, time is measured by events. So that the rising of the sun is the event that signals, oh, today is the beginning of the day. The setting of the sun tells us, oh, this is the end of the day. The earth on a different angle tells us that it's a different season. So what, but what do these events what do the, these things that me, we measure time with mean to the God who created them all? Um, he transcends time because he made everything that we reckon time by. So God exists outside the, all these events, the rising of the sun, the setting of the sun, the seasons that we actually measure time by. Uh, but here we are on, on the earth. Uh, we look at our watches. We stand in the express lane at Walmart and we're, we think, what? Well, this has taken more than five minutes. Um, we look at our calendars. Today was a very cold day here in New England. And so we look at our calendars and we say, oh, the calendar says warmer weather is ahead. So we measure day, we measure off time. We count days and years, but we're bound by time and we're bound by the events of life at certain times. And we measure our life by these events, by these times. So that's all an introduction to what our scripture occurs. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 15 says, uh, it really brings out a lot of these truths that our life is set by different times. So of all the passages in Ecclesiastes, perhaps you've heard this one. That's often read at funerals. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, 
and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. So, as the scripture points out, there are different times in life uh, that we are born and we count the years from that day of our birth. Uh, Each is born on a certain day and we measure our lifetime based on that event. And we call, we remember that event every year. We call it a birthday and we all measure our lifetimes by it. And even if some people turn 39 years old every single year, we still measure our life by that birthday. And and when we die, that's also written on our graves. So we have our our year of our birth and the year of our death, and that's often written on our graves. And I can't remember who said it, but one of the most important marks in uh, our life is that hyphen on our graves between the year we were born and the year we die, because in that hyphen, is included all the different times of our life, all the different events that we measure and we count off our life by. A lot of the events that are listed here in Ecclesiastes uh, and the bookends, right? Verse two, a time to be born and a time to die. But then everything underneath, in between, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to seek, a time to be cast away, a time to keep silent, a time to speak, a time for war, a time for peace. All of these things are contained in that hyphen between the year of our birth and the year of our death. And they count off, they mark the days. And the rest of the times that are described in verse verses 2 through 8 that I just read, a time to be born and, and harvest and all of that stuff, uh, they contrast the various occasions of human life because the list is many times it's kind of mutually exclusive, the pairs. In, the, in other words, the words you don't, you don't experience these things at the same time. In other words, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. Right? You can't kill someone and heal them at the same time. It's kind of mutually exclusive, exclusive, a time to weep and a time to laugh. And, and many of the times listed, we don't choose when they come. Right? They just happen to us and we react to it. So during this uh, this time where we're dealing with this pandemic, you know, it's a, a time to be sick and a time to mourn. But eventually, there'll be a time to heal. And, and those are the times in our life. And when the right season comes, it's a time to plant. Uh, but then the seasons change. It's a time to harvest. Other events in life, again, bring about the time of weeping and laughing and uh, weeping or laughing or morning or dancing. You see, human existence, it it happens within a set time. And that set time is set by God. It's our life and death. But within our lifetime, these very event these various events, they come and they go and they fill the time of life. And that's the thrust of again verses two through eight. But verse eleven points out Uh, That although our lives are constantly uh, constrained and largely dictated by by times and occasions of life, God has also given us 
the ability as humans to consider eternity, to, to consider the a timeless word of God. So look at verse 11. It says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity, that's timelessness, into man's heart. Yes, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So here we see that there's, there's two Hebrew words I want to draw your attention to. Okay, one is eth, or et, depending on if there's the dagesh leni, or forte, the dagesh. There's, anyways, um, that those are the, that's the particular time. That's the particular occasion. In Ecclesiastes, that's human perspective time, all right, et. So God has made everything beautiful in its et, in its time. And there's a, an et, a et to be born, an et to die time. That's the time, human perspective time. But then there's another word for time, and that is olam, and that's translated here, eternity. Uh, that, is, that is God perspective time. And these contrasting words are used in Ecclesiastes, in verse 11 in particular, to show the contrasting worlds uh, that humanity deals with compared to God. Um, and while God created the universe and, and, uh, and time that governs our lives, God also created humankind in such a way that we have an awareness of the eternal. That's why he says God has made everything beautiful in its time, but he's placed uh, olam, he's placed eternity time in our hearts. And, and although animals have life, their time awareness is really confined to their experiences, birth, death, uh, sleeping, waking, fighting, eating, not eating. But humans, God has given us this sense of time to go beyond ourselves. And so while we don't transcend time like God does, in our mind, we understand transcendence. Uh, in our minds, we constantly have the echo of eternity. We can transcend time by thinking of the time before the earth and sun were formed, even though right now we reckon uh, days by the sun's, um, you know, well, really by the earth's rotation, but, you know, as the sun rises and, 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 go, and sets, but yet we can, in our mind, still transcend that event because we can picture, we can Think about a time before the sun and the earth even existed. Um, and so when we think of time, uh, we can think of the time after the earth and the sun will be gone. See, time for us is measured within the created universe, but we can conceive a time in existence outside of this universe, outside of our experience. So in our hearts, we have, God has set that ability to contemplate eternity. Um, and I know these are pretty lofty concepts and you're like, whoa, you're getting really philosophical today. But that's where I think the scripture is taking us. It's opening up a window of, of existence, of time and life that sometimes we don't, we don't think about. But the human mind, unlike any other living thing on earth, can touch the timeless world of forever. And, and these echoes of eternity are even found in the here and now. Uh, so what I mean by that? is that even as we experience the times of life, the et, the, the human existent times of life, like the sun rising, uh, a baby being born, oftentimes when we witness those things, when we stare, stay at the, stand at the grave of a loved one, at these times we're often overcome with a profound sense that there is more to this moment, to this time, uh, than I'm experiencing right now. We sense in our hearts that there's an eternity, that this, at, that this particular time is igniting in our hearts, that's behind all of this. This is the forever, this is the eternity that transcends the moment that God has placed in our hearts. And, and with our senses, we experience the things of our, the world, but in our hearts, we experience and we, we can think of more eternal notions because God has put eternity in our hearts. It makes me also think of another scripture, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 18 uh, says, well, we look not at the things which are seen, uh, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And, and when we sense that, that just be that there's things outside the, the seen realm, um, the, the set times of our world realm, uh, but, but they're eternal. And yet for all of this human ability to, to know eternity, it's an, an again, ability that no other creature uh, has. 
although we cannot gr grasp the idea of this olam time, this eternity, uh, with our mind, we can't really grasp it with our hands. Uh, instead, our times are et, are set. We're bound by the times that, we're, that, that are set for us. Uh, so we can think about the time of the Roman Empire, for instance, but we can't actually go there. Uh, if, if we live in a time of famine, we can think of a time of plenty, but we're still bound by the time we're in and we'll experience famine. Uh, if there's a time of war, we can think of a time when there was peace, but we still exist in a time of war. So God has given humanity this wonderful gift of being able to transcend our set times in our hearts, in our minds. But this gift only makes us more aware of, of our limitations and, and this awareness of both eternity but then, uh, and the set limited times of humanity brings us to the writer's conclusion, which is in verse 14. He says, um, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. See, we know that God works on a level that transcends time, and therefore nothing on this world can change that, uh, that he's above those set times. We're constrained by the set times of birth and death and planting and harvesting and mourning and dance, all of that stuff. We're, we're confined by that, but God's not. And so we can't add anything to that olam time or take anything away from it. Um, but yet he has placed eternity in our hearts for a purpose. And that is so that what people should fear him. Now, I know you may think, hmm, that, that fear, that's like an Old Testament God. People should fear him. But the word fear does not mean be afraid as much as understanding the importance and gravity of God. Uh, fearing in the Old Testament, it, it means that of all of the things in life, what you fear is what is most important or, or, more, or most critical. Uh, it's more than being afraid, but but using the typical notion of fear as a kind of a starting point. So if a tiger, for instance, is about to pounce on you, you fear that tiger because at that moment, there is nothing as important to your well-being as the tiger. Uh, if you forget your anniversary, you're filled with fear, right? Because you know that your well-being is in jeopardy. Um, and so now take these concrete momentary examples of fear and consider eternity. There is nothing as important to your eternal well-being as, as God, because he's eternal. And it is, so it's not about being afraid as much as understanding the importance of something. Because even that tiger, uh, even your mad spouse, they, they can kill the body, but not the soul. And God placed the eternal in our hearts so that we would take eternity into consideration to... Whom will we fear? Whom will we consider the most important? Who is most critical or what is most critical in life? That's what we fear. And so fearing God is so given, having a sober understanding that God holds the key to our well-being on earth as well as eternity. Because, well, that's just the truth. And God has placed eternity in our hearts so that we, as the scripture says, 14, so that we properly fear him. Uh, we understand better than any, than any other creature that what God does is forever. It's eternal. It's on a time plane that transcends our own, uh, transcends our world and reaches into eternity. And that sense of eternity cries out in the times of life that, that give us a hunger, a, a fear, uh, a regard for the one who is forever. So again, it's not a surprise that the times of life, like, like birth and death, um, again, like har like re um, sowing and harvesting, these life-sustaining things, these life-important things that sustain us. Uh, it's, not, it, it's no surprise that those are the things that often ignite in our hearts that, that sense of the eternal. Um, because like in the scripture passage, we understand that we're bound by those times of life, those et, the time to born, the time to die, all of that. But we also understand that there's another kind of time, the olam time, the eternity. And we see when we see the contrast 
between our short uh, time-bound life and God's forever, we understand, okay, that God's to be feared. He's to be uh, held up as the most important thing because God holds all of our time in his hands, all of our at time, all of our set time. Um, and, and again, it's not a surprise that within our hearts, there's always that hunger for eternity, that hunger for um, forever, that God-sized hole in our hearts. It's not surprising that the set times of, of human life, like birth and death, the rising of the sun, would often ignite, again, that eternal hunger that God has put within us. And I think that's what our scripture is getting at. And so what, what's our takeaway from this? I mean, again, I've, got, I've done, <laughs> we talked quite about, about some theory and theology and theory of time and, and all sorts of uh, really, you know, kind of mind-blowing things. But what's the takeaway from this? Well, I think that the, the times of life, they, they come and they go, whether we like it or not. So right now we're in this time of, you know, stay at home, this time of quarantine. And yeah, we, we didn't choose that. Um, and so they come and go. But even in the times of life, there is a deep hunger for the eternal. And in this eternal call is the background whisper, I think, of that pervades all of life's occasions that, that, that um, we read about in Ecclesiastes 3. Uh, we can try to stuff that hunger. We can try to ignore that hunger, but it won't go away. You know, many times in my life, I tried to, to stuff that hunger with earthly things. Um, but that hunger for the eternal, it didn't go away. Or I've tried to ignore that hunger for the eternal, but it can't be ignored. It keeps cropping up. It keeps invading our times of life because God has set that in our hearts. And so maybe some of you, as you listen to this, you're feeling that way today. Well, there's a purpose to that hunger, just as there is a purpose for our hunger for food. And that purpose for our eternal hunger is so that we would seek eternal food, and not be satisfied with just earthly things. Because God ultimately put that hunger, that sense of the eternal within us, so that we would desire the eternal gift that he wants to give us and is offering us through his son, Jesus Christ. It makes me think of when Jesus was teaching the crowds on, uh, this is in the Gospel of John, we won't turn there, I'll just read from my notes, but in, in John chapter 6, verse uh, 27. Jesus is teaching the crowds. He had just uh, done a miracle and uh, provided, uh, multiplied uh, lots of bread. And so people are like, oh, great bread, free eats. And they were really excited about that. Well, in John chapter 6, verse 27, he says to the crowd, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, the Father God has set his seal. And like that crowd, many of us have been working for the food that perishes. We've been confined to the times of life, and our lives are filled with, with all the things our hearts desire, good food, nice house, entertainment, and yet for all of our work, we're not, it doesn't satisfy all of our desires, does it? There is still that gnawing hunger for the eternal, for purpose. And, and Jesus is saying the same thing to us today as he said to that crowd um, in in John chapter 6, he said to the crowd, uh, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. And so perhaps like those in the crowd of Jesus' day, you're, you're thinking, you're asking, right, well, what shall I do? You know, what shall I do to work the works of God? Because you know you, um, you want the eternal. You want that eternal food. Well, Jesus' is, answer is the same Today, as it was back then, in verse 29, this is what Jesus said to them when they said, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? He said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That the work that, that we need to do, if we have that hunger, we want to feed that eternal hunger, the work is, 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 to, is to trust in the eternal gift that God has given us through Christ. And when you place your trust, your belief in Christ, in, in that eternity that God has, has, uh, has made available to us through him, we're responding to the eternity that God has placed in our heart. It's a call. It's a hunger that God actually wants to feed. He put that in us so that we would long for an eternal relationship with him, which he gives us and that purpose we find 
and in uh, knowing him through Christ. Because God has a purpose for that hunger that he put in your heart. He has a purpose for you. And that purpose finds its fulfillment in eternity. Yes, we have a purpose here on earth that we fulfill. But until we fulfill our eternal purpose of knowing God, of receiving his forgiveness, of, of placing our faith in him, there will always be that hunger. So stop living just for the food that perishes. Stop being bound by the times of life that, that are set, the et time. And pursue your eternal purpose. Pursue an eternal purpose and hunger that God has placed in every human being so that you would fear him. And when I say fear, I mean you would pursue him. Or you would pursue God above all else because you understand that, yeah, my times are set. I am bound. I'm, I'm going to be born and I'm going to die. But God, he is forever. He is eternal. And so if you're in that boat, it's very simple. Just cry out to God. Uh, he knows your heart. He said eternity in your heart, so he knows your heart. So it's not the exact words you say. It's simply crying out to God and receiving his forgiveness, receiving the gift of eternity, the fulfillment of the gift of eternity he placed in your heart so that he would give you that food, that eternal food for eternal life. Um, that's what Christ offers. And so cry out to him and receive that gift of eternity.